say she's trying to get over the jet lag. Trying to get my legs moving and um, trying to make the right decisions, meaning um, wait for the right shots to actually play aggressive and, and go for it and um, just find the balance of offense and defense. Caroline Wozniacki. Meanwhile, men's former world number one Andy Murray has withdrawn from the Brisbane International with a hip problem, further putting in doubt his prospect of being fit in time for the Australian Open later this month. Murray hasn't played a competitive match since Wimbledon in July. The Melbourne cricket ground pitch for the fourth Ashes cricket test has been officially rated as poor by the International Cricket Council after last week's drawn test between Australia and England. Only 24 wickets fell in five days, drawing criticism from both teams. Cricket Australia has two weeks to respond to the report. The Arsenal football manager Arsene Wenger has been charged by the English Football Association over comments he made to match officials in the wake of his side's one-all draw at West Bromwich Albion on New Year's Eve. The Frenchman was handed a four-match ban for misconduct last January for pushing the fourth official after his team's 2-1 win over Burnley and risks another suspension for his latest outburst. And that's news from RNZ Pacific, and we'll return you to RNZ National. Good morning. These, uh, these uh, 22, or at least 22 people that have died, do we know like, how, how they, were they fired upon by, um, by the armed militias? How, how did they uh, die? I mean, the um, Iranian the Revolutionary Guards are adopting a tougher line compared to the early days of the protest, so... There is more violence now on both sides, actually, because, you know, based on the videos that are coming out of Iran, it's not only the police, you know, stepping up to crack down, the, the protesters are also becoming confrontational. Uh, so it's difficult to get confirmation about how these people have died. What we know is that these people have died. The crackdown is intensifying, and then there is the revolutionary guards have been unleashed on the streets, both in the capital and in the provinces. You know, what is interesting this time is that these protests are mainly happening in the provinces and is not focused in Tehran compared to the 2009 unrest, for example. Yes, I wanted to ask how this differs from 2009. I saw a video actually on Twitter of people pulling down one of those big um, advertising boards of the Ayatollah, and I thought, wow, is that is that unprecedented? Did we see that kind of thing back in 2009? I mean, it, definitely slogans have become harsher. You, as you mentioned, they are targeting the Ayatollah Khamenei, the Supreme Leader, in a direct way that I was back in Tehran, I was on the ground in Tehran in 2009, and I, I, and I there was death to the theater chance, but nothing directly as what, witness, what we are witnessing in the past six days, really. So the slogans are harsher. The other, I think the nature of the protests are different. This time it's working class revolting, whereas in 2009 it was the middle classes. The working class now are unhappy about the economic situation. They're the most affected by the economic situation. The other big difference is that it, the, the provincial nature of the protest this time compared to the last time, which was mainly focused in the capital, Tehran. That's why this time it's more difficult for the authorities to control it because, you know, it's everywhere. No other under house arrest. That's that's some of the big differences, really. And probably the development of and, and the use of social media as well. Although we have seen, of course, uh, that the, the authorities they're clamping down on that. I think they've banned Instagram and a few other platforms. So, I mean, how hard is it for someone like you at the moment to be getting um, the, the right information uh, out of Tehran? I mean, the Iranians after I mean decades of you know, internet restrictions, all sort of, you know, satellite jamming have realized, find, they found ways to circumvent these restrictions. So it's extraordinary how resilient they've, you know, they've become. So there are still ways to get in touch with people. WhatsApp, for example, still works. Um, Telegram is the most popular social network in Iran. It's bigger than Facebook and Twitter, and it is Blocked. Still, people use VPN, for example, to use Telegram. People have been using VPN for ages because, you know, Iranians are on Facebook in millions and Facebook is blocked in Iran. So um, Iranians have found ways to communicate. So, but, but that's true because the internet speed is very low in Iran because of the blocking.
we can get in touch with people now. But um, even after the apps were blocked, the protest continued. So that shows that it had little, little, if any, impact. And despite all that, all that blocking, of course, people in Iran will, will, will have known that Donald Trump has been fairly vocal about this, saying the U.S. is watching and, and talking about Tehran's brutal and corrupt regime. How are the authorities there likely to react to that? We know they've already uh, ramped up the rhetoric against Saudi Arabia. What else are we hearing from Rouhani and the Ayatollah? I mean, the, I mean, the Rouhani, of course, uh, has said it directly that uh, Trump is not in a position to express sympathy with Iran because just a few month, you know, months ago, he imposed a travel ban, a blanket travel ban on all Iranians for entering the U.S. I mean, as an Iranian myself, frankly, I